Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional materials available on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an anonymous chat session allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. All of the efforts of Telema Press, including this lecture, are made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Help us to help humanity by making a donation. Telema Press is a non-profit corporation. Donations are tax deductible. For more information, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today we have arrived at the ninth lecture in our series on the esoteric astrology of Gnosis. The number nine is definitive. This number indicates a very profound science related to the ninth sphere. But to understand what the ninth sphere is, we have to understand something about the Kabbalah. The ninth zodiacal sign is Sagittarius. And the image or the symbol utilized to represent the zodiacal influence of Sagittarius is a centaur. A centaur is an ancient symbol from Greek mythology and beyond, which depicts a creature who has the upper body, the torso of a man. But from the waist downwards, he is a horse. So he has four legs, the body of the horse, and the upper form of a human being. This symbol represents a profound understanding of the nature of the path to the self-realization of the being. And it's vital that as students of the path to understand the nature of the self, we have to understand and remember the symbol of the centaur. Many times when we arrive to any esoteric group, we approach the study of any particular religion or any particular mystical science. We're confronted with the instructors, the guides, those people who teach, who instruct, who organize groups, and who explain the nature of their religion or science. 
whether we call them shaman, priest, lama, teacher. All of these people receive projected onto them the ideas of the students. So when we arrive to any school, we tend to come with our own set of values, our own set of images that we project onto those instructors or priests or lamas. Typically, we see them as something pure, as something holy. There's nothing wrong with this. Anyone who has within them their own essence, their own consciousness, their own spark of divinity has that element of purity and deserves respect and deserves honor. Unfortunately, in many religions and schools, this projection of the student is taken advantage of by instructors, by priests, by lamas. And utilized in order to keep that student loyal, worshipful, subservient, often under the pretext of something related to what we would call guru yoga or the worship of the teacher, the worship of the guru. We have to understand that the worship of the guru is important. The respect of the teacher is important. But we also have to always remember the symbol of the centaur. The centaur is half man and half beast. There are many lamas, teachers, masters, people who call themselves masters, who are very sanctimonious, who project the appearance of sanctity, the appearance of purity, who act holy, who dress a particular way, who use certain kinds of mannerisms, who project an image of a saint, but inside, they are not. Inside, they are what the Master Jesus indicated, full of filth and rottenness, whitened on the outside, like a grave, like a tomb, which has a beautiful appearance, very pure and white, but inside is filthy. Truly, all of us are like that. All of us have that contradiction. Something pure with something impure. And unfortunately, we love to maintain the image of purity, of supposed sanctity. And this projection is very insincere and a cause for suffering. To understand this matter in its depth, we have to investigate our own selves, our own mind, our own heart. And it helps if we understand something of the nature of the tree of life. The Kabbalah, or the tree of life, is a very sophisticated map, a diagram consisting of ten spheres organized in a pattern of three triangles of three with the tenth fallen and hanging from the bottom of the lowest triangle. These spheres represent values of the consciousness. 
qualities of the soul. They are not concrete in the way that our mind tries to make them. So many times when we study the tree of life, we try to assign definitive attributes or definitive concrete meaning to each sphere. But this is a limiting tendency. In reality, each sphere represents a world, represents one component of a large structure, which can be viewed from different angles and in different ways, according to the need. So this is why we can see that the tenth sphere, which is called Malkut, means the kingdom in Hebrew. This is representing the physical world, this third dimension. But it also represents our physical body. It also represents the lowest aspect of the descent of the ray of creation in terms of the way energy functions and manifests. Malkut is symbolic. It's likewise all the other spheres on the tree. But we describe the tree and its spheres from certain points of view in order to understand our own psychology, in order to understand the nature of energy in, in matter, how energy and matter interrelate. When we're discussing the soul, we describe how this ray of creation descends. It descends from the absolute. The absolute is a vast, unmanifested entity or non-entity. It is incomprehensible to our mind. It is uncreated light that potential for manifestation, but not manifest. The absolute can also be called the emptiness. But this does not mean that it is nothing. It is something, but it is nothing like what we know. We can call it nothingness, but that does not mean that it does not exist. It is existent, but without an existence that we understand. In Buddhism, this is called shunyata. We can also call it the void. In his writings, the Master Samael on Vior spoke often of the illuminating void. If you consider that term carefully, you see a very beautiful symbol. It is a void, a space without space. It is a vast emptiness that is yet full. It is something, but it is nothing. But it is illuminating. It is irradiating. And that irradiation, that illumination, is called the Ein Sof. This is a, the purest, most immaculate light, which is yet nothing because it is part of this absolute. But that illuminating void, the light, is what manifests, bursts forth, and creates. This is the ray of creation, also called the cosmic Christ. Quetzalcoatl. Avalokiteshvara, Kuan Yin. It 
it's important to understand the nature of the void. But that understanding can only arise through direct experience, not through the intellect. This is vital to grasp. In the esoteric traditions, it's stated that the one who experiences the void consciously is changed, becomes different, becomes distinct, becomes a person unlike other people. Because the nature of that experience is so penetrating. It is as if you're struck by lightning. It transforms the consciousness. And provides a kind of comprehension that is distinctly different from creatures who have yet to experience the nature of emptiness. This light, the root unfolds itself through the wisdom of Da'at, which is the hidden sphere in the tree of life. And all of creation ensues. We have all the levels of being, all the levels of life, all the dimensions, all the many worlds, the myriad of creatures who exist. Within each atom, within each particle, is a connection to the Ein Sof is a portion, a particle, a link. In simpler terms, we can examine the nature of our own physical body. This is something that we can observe with our own sensual mind, this mind that depends upon the five senses. We perceive that we now are within a physical organism, which has certain attributes, certain qualities. It has certain capacities to move, to function, most of which occur without our conscious intervention, such as digestion, circulation, the, develop, the functioning and development of the endocrine system, breathing. But any scientist of this day and age will tell you that your physical body is not, in its core, what it appears to be. The physical body is just a collection of components. This physical body is active, is providing a home for our consciousness to function within, because it has a very delicate balance of components present. We have the capacity to breathe, we have a heart which is pumping blood, drawing that breath. We have all of the many organs, the skin, the bones, the veins, the glands, all of which function in this miraculous way, which we hardly comprehend, much less remain aware of from moment to moment. Nonetheless, we depend upon it to exist to think, to love. We use this vehicle to perform all of our activities, and yet we remain unaware of it. Looking deeper, we can see that if we removed any one piece of this puzzle of the physical body, we would cease to exist as we are now. If you remove the heart, if you remove the brain, if you remove the lungs, the spinal column, the liver, any one of these pieces, that body will cease to function. And then what? We don't know. Existence continues, but we don't know about it because we're not conscious of that. So from this point of view, we can say, that our existence in this moment is dependent upon conditions. Meaning, our physical body does not exist independently of itself. It exists because it is an accumulation of components that are necessary in their precise balance for it to function and remain functioning. 
In Buddhism, this is called dependent origination. And in its more elaborate explanation, it's represented by the 12 nidanas, which are these 12 interlocking sections encircling the wheel of samsara. Dependent origination states simply, nothing exists independently. Everything is dependent on something else. But we have to comprehend the nature of that statement from the point of view of the emptiness, of the void. The void itself exists, but not in a form that we understand. And all things that are in creation exist from that fundamental ground of the Ain Sof. Our own self-nature is the same. We believe that we have this self. Firstly, many people think the physical body is what they are. And that's it. The question comes then, when your physical body is sleeping and you dream, who are you? Your physical body is there in the bed. You're somewhere else. You're in another place. And you can have conscious experiences being in another place, touching, smelling, tasting, seeing, hearing, in the same way that you would in a physical body, but you're not in a physical body. And you know that because you can fly. You can stretch. You can become another shape. You can become invisible. You can walk through walls. You can breathe underwater. Many things that the physical body cannot do. How is that? Who is that self? Some religions, some traditions state that that is the real self. That that dream aspect, which they're calling a spirit or a soul. But religion, in its depth, does not state that. The Buddha taught it the best. The Buddha taught a very clear and precise understanding of what the self is. Unfortunately, in these times, he's grossly misinterpreted. Many people nowadays have the mistaken impression that the Buddha said there is no self. This is not what he said. The Buddha stated, there is no independently existing self which is true. When you understand in terms of the emptiness and dependent origination, you can comprehend this statement. But students of Gnosis will say, how can that be? We study Gnosis and are are studying that we have a real inner self. We have a real inner being. We have our own inner God. We have our Atman. We have our own particular individual divine father, our own particular individual divine mother. What about them? Aren't they our real self? Yes and no. This is the difficulty. There are actually two truths. There's the conventional truth And there is the ultimate truth. Conventional truth is what we all have the capacity to confirm right now. We exist. We're here physically with some degree of awareness of that. And we can confirm and discuss the existence of the physical body and that each of us can say, yes, I'm here in a physical body. This is conventional truth. That person who's confirmed that level of conventional truth can easily say, I don't believe in astral projection or astral travel. I don't believe in other dimensions. 
because they've not experienced that. So their degree of comprehension, of conventional truth, is limited to the physical world in Malkut. And they can't be blamed for that or criticized for that. That is their degree of understanding. But someone who's had a conscious experience out of their physical body, who's been awake in another dimension and has flown or floated or passed through a wall or a ceiling or traveled across the earth to distant places consciously, that person knows in their own experience, no matter what anybody else says, that that was real. And that those types of experiences are real. In spite of what the scientists say, they know it's real. So for that person, their understanding of conventional truth has expanded. Now they've confirmed something about other dimensions. They have an understanding beyond just physical truth. The same is true through each sphere of the tree of life. When we teach Gnosis, when we study Gnosis, we always talk about our real being, our real self. Often, we talk about that real being as chesed, atman, in Sanskrit. Our own particular inner divine father. And from the point of view of that sphere, he is indeed our true being, our real self. And this is more or less what the Brahmins were stating in India when the Buddha arrived. Unfortunately, the Brahmins stopped there. They thought Atman was it. That Atman was, in fact, a concrete self, indivisible and undependent on anything. And this is what the Buddha came to correct. The Buddha said, Atman is not the real self. There is no independently existing self. So how do we understand that in Gnosis? Atman exists because he is a child of his own father and mother. Shiva Shakti. That divine couple, Yotava, who unites in that to create their son, who in Egyptian mysticism was called Horus. Osiris, Isis, unite, and they have Horus, the golden child. So Atman does not exist independent of himself, independent of other things. He exists dependent upon his own parents, his own progenitors. So we understand then that whichever level of the tree of life we are examining... There is no independent origination, self-originated, independent of all other things. Each aspect of the tree of life depends upon others and is there because of others. If we further investigate each level of the tree, we discover we have to keep going higher. When we look into our own psyche, we start to try to comprehend who we are, we find a lot of contradiction. And in each element that we examine, we have to penetrate deeper and deeper and deeper. The ultimate step, penetrating throughout all the levels of the self, we arrive at the conclusion that the Buddha taught. At the heart of all existing things is emptiness. The void, the absolute. Which is the only thing that is real. And yet, it is not real in the way we understand reality. When this ray of creation 
unfolds itself. And the light is projected as that. Oris Atman, the spirit, is born. And this is in the sixth dimension, very high. He in himself is a three in one. He has two souls. He has a divine soul, which in Sanskrit is called Buddhi. And he has a human soul, which in Sanskrit is called Manas. These three in one are called the monad. So we often discuss the monad as our real self. And from our point of view, in terms of conventional truth, the monad is our real self. But even the monad has a real self beyond him. The monad, Atman, in order for his own spiritual development to progress, for that child of ours to grow, he has to manifest himself into lower levels of creation to gather knowledge. And he does that through his human soul, Manas. This unfolding occurs through the four bodies of sin. And these are, of course, what we know of as mind or intellect in Netza. What we know of as the astral body or emotion in Hod. The ethereal body uh, or vital energy in the world of Yasod and the physical These four become the vessel, the vehicle, the chariot. If you know anything about Hinduism, if you've studied a little bit about the Mahabharata, you know that on the battlefield, Arjuna and Krishna prepare to go to war. Arjuna would be the human soul who stands in the chariot. The chariot, in this case, represents the bodies of the soul, the mind, the mental body, the heart, the astral body, the vital energies, which is the vital or ethereal body, and then the physical body. That's also symbolized in the Mahabharata by the Pandava brothers. When this ray of creation unfolds the structure, the spark of the essence, this little percentage of the human soul, descends and enters into the physical world, or in other words, the wheel of samsara. The spark then begins to develop itself, to enter into physical bodies, beginning in the mineral kingdom. That essence, the consciousness, is very simple, very pure. It's directly descending from Atman, from the self. But it's very simple. It needs knowledge. It needs to grow. It needs to gather wisdom. So it enters first into bodies, physical bodies of minerals, which we know of as our minerals, the elements of the earth. Spiritually, that essence, that particle, is what we would call a gnome or a pygmy. It's an elemental of nature. As we've discussed in many lectures, that conscious spark slowly and progressively perfects itself as it works within a given physical body to perfect it and little by little is initiated into more and more complex organisms so that it can gather more and more knowledge and have more and more interaction with the four elements of nature and to dominate them and control them more and more. And this happens progressively through the mineral kingdom, 
through the plant kingdom, through the animal kingdom. The entirety of that progression can take millions of years. Depends on the quality of that essence. But the progression ultimately is is crafting a mind. It's crafting these vessels, these four bodies, which were given to that soul by nature, by the Divine Mother. But unfortunately, they are not perfect. They are what we would call lunar bodies or protoplasmic bodies. They are mind. Mind in their level. A plant has a mind in its level. It has consciousness in its level, the level of a plant. And there are many levels of plants, very simple forms of plant life, ranging up to very complex ones. Same in the animal kingdom. An animal has mind. And when I state mind, I'm not talking about intellect. I'm talking about a vessel for the consciousness, a vehicle through which the consciousness can interrelate and understand. A mind is a transformer of energy. We can see in the animal kingdom Some creatures have very simple minds. They can understand and interrelate with other creatures at a very simple level. But then you have creatures like the dolphin, the whale, the eagle, who have a much more sophisticated form of mind. This is not about the brain size. The mind uses the brain but is not limited to the brain. <clears throat> so this process of evolution is a process of developing mind. And when that essence, the soul consciousness, that spark, reaches the ultimate level that it can reach in its own path through those kingdoms, it's granted the right into the humanoid kingdom. So that soul, clothed with its lunar bodies, enters into the humanoid kingdom. The humanoid kingdom is a very special place. The Buddha himself said, it is the most precious body in nature, in these kingdoms. The reason is the physical body of the humanoid is so sophisticated. All of our science and our medicine today still does not understand the physical body that we have. Still, we are grasping to understand it and fail to. And still, we only are using a very tiny percentage of our brain And we think we're so elevated. There are enormous capacities within the physical body which are yet untapped by most people. The physical organism of the humanoid is a womb. It is a place for that soul to be born to a new kingdom. It is the platform from which angels are born. An angel is a perfected human being. An angel is truly one who has sanctity, who has purity. An animal does not. The animal mind is a mind that has grown and developed under the guidance of instinct 
and all those animal qualities which are necessary in the animal kingdom in order to develop the understanding of an animal. But to develop the understanding of a human being requires that we stop being animals. We have to conquer the animal nature that we have within. This is a centaur. You see in a centaur the body of a beast, of an animal, from which is emerging a man. The man is coming out of the animal. But he is not a man. Neither is he an animal. He's both. He's mixed. That's the problem. In Greek mythology, the centaur was always described as being... uh, really grotesque, foul, filthy, perverted, degenerated, a slave of passion. Who are we? Who are we nowadays? Do we dominate and control our passions? Or does our anger rule us? Does our lust rule us? Do we make decisions in life because of what our God wants in us or because of what our envy wants? Because we want what someone else has. We desire what someone else has. Many in spiritual groups and religions love to believe that they are humble and even project humility. But they're proud of their humility. That's not humbleness. That's not humility. That's pride. Many in spiritual groups renounce material things but covet spiritual development and are greedy for spiritual knowledge. Many don't steal money but they steal ideas. They steal time from others. They steal attention. They steal energy. Many claim to be walking a path of purity, not eating meat, wearing white. And yet, in their mind, they brutalize their fellow man with criticism, with hate, with jealousy. Where is sanctity in that? Where is purity? in our own heart, in our own mind. This is the nature of the centaur. This potential to become human, which is trapped in the body of an animal. The body, in this case, the body of the animal of the centaur, is symbolic. The horse has four legs, which are these four bodies of sin. And those are the bodies, the lunar bodies, that we as a psyche stand on. Our animal intellect, which reasons and justifies based on desire. If we want something, if we envy something, we justify it with our animal mind. And we call it a need. I need that. I need that new dress. I need those new shoes. I need that person. When really that need is desire. It's lust. It's gluttony. It's greed. It's all cravings for sensation. Or I need to get out of this marriage could be fear, could be hate, could be lust. What we call need is usually a want or a desire. And we justify that with this animal intellect, the lunar mental body. Likewise with the heart. Those needs, those wants, those desires, fears, anxieties, resentment, Anger towards our parents, towards our friends, towards our 
spouse. Is the animal desire of that lunar emotional body or lunar astral body. This is why in Sanskrit it's called Kamarupa, body of desire. This is the coarse body of illusion, which in Tibetan Tantrism is stated very clearly, it has to be destroyed because it is diabolic. It's diabolic because While as an animal, we needed certain elements to help us evolve as an animal. When we entered the humanoid kingdom, we received the gift of reasoning. The ability to compare A and B. The ability to utilize some self-will, some independence. As an animal, we're very much guided by collective mind. And the higher animals you see are becoming more and more independent, more and more singular, like the big cats, tigers, like the eagle. That image of independence is what the humanoid has to ultimately fully cultivate, which is human will. The ability to perform right action, not from instinct, not from desire, not from habit, but because it is in line with the higher laws of nature. To become a king and queen of nature is to become a ruler over those elements of nature. But unfortunately, the reasoning that we receive puts us in a position of great responsibility. We then have to take responsibility for our actions, whereas an animal we didn't. But someone who's given the capacity to develop individual will also receives the responsibility of individual will. That's why we have karma. Karma simply measures energy in nature. There are laws in nature which state each thing must return to its point of departure. Each element, each energy. If this energy in my left hand becomes too elevated, nature will push it back. This is part of how nature functions. Even the materialistic scientists now are confirming this. Karma is a physical law, which Newton stated, for every action, an equal and opposite reaction. But that applies to emotional energy too. If you're projecting anger, that energy has to come back. If you're projecting Desire, envy, lust, there's karma, consequences. This is why we suffer. Each action that we perform under the guidance of animal desire, whether it's through the heart, through the mind, or physically, we accrue karma for that. And the karma is encapsulated It's not just some idea. Remember what Einstein taught. You can't destroy energy. Energy becomes matter and matter becomes energy. This is true of qualities of the soul as well. When you, as an individual, someone who is acting on your own, feed an element of lust, feeling lust for another person, and you give that feeling energy, fuel, something is created in your mind. And that something is called an I. It's called an ego. That something, let's say it is lust. That lust is constituted by the nature of that, the way it was created at that moment. Let's say you saw another person who you felt lust for, desire. That lust has thoughts in it. It has feelings in it, emotion, and it has vital energy. Three aspects. And the physical body takes those energies and channels them. And the mind and the heart take those energies and channels them according to our will. And the result is 
those forces channeled through lust create an I in hell. Our own personal psychological hell, our own subconsciousness, our own unconsciousness, our own infraconsciousness. When someone criticizes us and we feel that pain and we feel bad about ourselves, that energy is creating an element in the mind. Modern times, they call it a trauma. But that trauma is a material element that's produced in more subtle levels of nature. Whatever you think, whatever you feel, has interrelations with matter on those levels of nature. Successively, through lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, through the humanoid kingdom, we have been doing this from moment to moment from physical body to physical body, creating new elements, creating new egos, creating pride, envy, lust, fear, laziness, gluttony, greed, hate. And all of those individual pieces are what we call the ego, what we call the I, what we mistake as our real self. This train of thinking in your mind, which you think is you, is not you. It's the ego. That chatter of constantly flowing thinking is the, the murmuring, the bubbles arising from all these submerged bottles. Submerged within our own mind. This is the beast. And we walk through life on our four legs according to our karma. The karma which is trapped and encapsulated by all these individual eyes or egos. And because we continue to listen to them and be influenced by them and be enslaved by them, we continue to create more. So our mind becomes heavier and heavier. If you observe a homeless person, not all of them, but some of them, have lost their mental equilibrium. They have lost the capacity to manage their own mind. The personality has fractured. And these eyes and elements are escaping. And that person is perceiving them and talking to them having conversations, but they've lost cognizance. They've lost that central point of gravity. And so they're becoming very disequilibrated, very unbalanced. You know what we call this person? Ahanas Moose. This is a person with a double center of gravity who can't keep their balance. But there's not just one kind of Hanas Moose. There are many. We are the same as those people. We just don't see it yet. We think they're different from us, but they're not. They are exactly like us, but they had some experience. Could be one thing. Maybe they lost their job. Their own karma put them in a position. Maybe they lost their job or their spouse. Maybe they got sick. So their support as a personality, as a functioning person in society was broken and that experience was so strong it broke their personality and they became mad. Gnosis points out that all of us are at that exact precipice. It takes a little push to push us over the edge. Little. One trauma. One thing can go wrong in our lives and we will lose control. Our personality becomes shattered and we go mad. That's because this I, this ego, is so heavy. Hanas Mus is a term which I've been told comes from Arabic. And it refers to someone who has a double center of gravity. The 
first type of Hannes Mus, well, first of all, in this tradition, we have different ways of analyzing the Hannes Musen. Hannes Musen is plural for Hannes Mus. Samael on the Or analyzed the phenomena of the Hannes Musen in a, in a variety of different ways. So the way I'm going to look at today is from his book, The Elimination of Satan's Tale. And I chose this particular point of view because it's more directly applicable to us in our daily lives. But the other points of view about them are equally valid. The first type of Hannes Mus is just a degenerated person. Someone who has no real force of will, who's weak, who's just tossed about by life from event to event. This type of Hannes Mus has a double center of gravity because they have a center of gravity in the ego and they have a little spark still of free consciousness or the essence, the buddhatta. They still have a little peace. So this is a weak, degenerated soul with no real force. Now, this person of the example, like a homeless person who's lost their mental equilibrium and the personality is fractured, generally speaking, we state that this type of person is on their last existence as a humanoid, as an intellectual animal. And that's why their suffering is so great. Because that mind has become so degenerated, so complicated, and the karma is so heavy that nature cannot sustain that psyche in this level of existence. It's too heavy. So out of compassion, God gives a, a doorway to cleanse that soul of its karma. And this doorway is the doorway into hell, the abyss, the averno, the klipot. So the, that homeless person of our example will die. And that soul, that essence, will not incarnate again in a humanoid entity as a person like us. But instead, they will begin the slow process of devolution back down the wheel. First in animal bodies <clears throat> to dissolve all those animal elements of the mind. To break all those bottles and free the little spark of purity that's inside each one. Little by little, the Divine Mother breaks down that I until the essence is freed in the second death, which the Bible mentions. This is a long process. And it's talked about in, in detail in the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri, who was an initiate. This first type of Hannes Mus passes through this process relatively quickly, but not easily. It's very painful. If you've ever had a nightmare, you're dreaming in these levels. You're perceiving hell. What's there? Because you have that in your mind. Those elements which live there. A nightmare happens because your soul, your consciousness, has particles trapped in that level of your own mind. And you experience that. And it's terrifying. Most of us have no recollection, most of the time, of that happening. But it's happening every night. The second type of Hannes Mus has a lot of energy. has a lot of vitality. <clears throat> this type uses all that energy to feed their desires. To act. This type of person is very consumed with their desires. Lustful desires desires for sensations through drugs, 
through greed for money, for power, for fame, for recognition, for material things, for social status. And they pursue those desires aggressively. <clears throat> this type of person, of course, has invested a lot more energy in the I, in the ego. And so that ego, that karma, is heavier. So they, too, when they've exhausted their opportunity in humanoid bodies, will be recycled by nature through the process of the second death. But it will take longer. It could be a lot longer. They have more karma. More pride, more anger, more fear, more lust. So it takes longer for nature to break that down and once again free that soul so it can try again. The third type has entered into some kind of occult studies. Has done some kind of exploration of what is beyond physical matter. What is beyond the senses. It's pretty assured. The chances are If you're studying this kind of information, coming to Gnosis and studying Gnosis, you would be one of the third type. Because you have a predisposition in your psyche to understand religion, to understand the esoteric, to understand the occult, the hidden. But the karma of that, the recurrence of that from past existences, due to the last age we've just exited, it's pretty much sure that most of us, in searching for the light, wound up in schools of black magic. In trying to find the hidden, the esoteric, wound up in schools that were teaching wrong things. And due to that, we create egos or elements of the mind that are related to black tantrism, black magic, or other practices using rituals and forces in the wrong way. It may appear perfectly good on the surface, but if it's out of alignment with the will of God, it's wrong, it's black. This third type then has developed a kind of karma or a kind of um, responsibility, which is different, because they acquired some degree of knowledge, some degree of understanding, so they have more karma because they misuse it. So once they exhaust their opportunities in a physical body, they're recycled by nature and it takes even longer to cleanse that karma, to purify that soul. Well, then we have the fourth type. The fourth type in this particular model has developed some degree of the soul. What does that mean? The heart of any religion, the esoteric heart, is the science to be born again, which is an exact method. Some call it tantra. Some call it alchemy. Some call it daat. But it is a form of understanding and knowledge which utilizes all the capacities of the physical body in order to create the perfect human being. To utilize all of our energies, all of our forces, in order to create the soul. To give birth to the soul. Which is what Jesus was indicating in the Gospels, to be born again. And that is the science of the ninth sphere. The ninth sphere, counting downwards on the tree of life, is yasod, which is related to vital energy or ethereal energy and is also related to the sexual organs, to the sexual energy. Because to be born is a sexual 
problem. Everything that is born is born sexually. There's no exception to that. Every creature, every angel, is born because of the laws that God has put into place. Sex is the law on all levels. But let's not confuse the sexuality of the animal kingdom with the sexuality of the human kingdom. These are different. That's why the law is given to that entity, that spark of consciousness, when it enters the humanoid kingdom. You shall not fornicate anymore because you need to conquer your animal nature. So you have to renounce that. Renounce your animal behaviors and become a human being. And those who do that, who begin to harness the sexual forces and begin to understand how to develop the mind in the right way, begin to create solar mind, not lunar mind, solar. Solar because soul, the sun, is related to that light which irradiates from the Ain Soth, the cosmic Christ, the light of the world, the sun of the sun. And that light, the ray, has its exponent here in the ninth sphere through the sexual energy. Here in that, at the level of the throat, through the word. The one who wants to become an angel has to be born as an angel through the proper use of sexuality. This is by raising the serpent of the kundalini, transmuting the sexual forces in the physical body, raising the kundalini of the physical body, transforming the forces of the ethereal body, and raising the serpent of the ethereal body, transforming the forces of the astral body, and raising the serpent of the astral body. And when that serpent is raised, the serpent of the kundalini in the astral body, the solar astral body is created. Symbolically, this is the first coming of Christ in us. Because that creation is Christic energy, solar energy, energy from the sun. It's pure it is a creation of the Christ, not Divine Mother Nature. Which means that that body does not belong to the lunar forces of Divine Mother Nature. Which means that that soul has acquired the very first degree of immortality. The very first element of it. Not true immortality, but the first degree of it. Meaning, that soul or astral body is not subject to the laws of evolution and devolution. A split happens. That center of gravity that we had before, mostly in the ego and a little bit in the consciousness, has split a lot. The solar astral body is a new vehicle, a new creation, born of the spirit and the water which is separate from the klipoth. Which means that that soul now has a foot in each world. One foot in the worlds of the spirit, the soul, and one in hell. This is a very dangerous place to be because those two spheres move in very different ways and it's very easy to lose your balance. Very easy to fall. This is why the Master Samael stated, you're never closer to becoming a demon than when you're close to becoming an angel. Because to balance these psychological elements is very difficult. This is a centaur trapped between two worlds, part beast, part man. This is the fourth type. The problem here is if that soul who managed to reach at least the level of creating the solar astral body now 
is in this very precarious position because if they persist in listening to the ego, to the mind, to desire, they will be recycled by nature. The problem is that double center of gravity. If they don't eliminate the ego quickly, they can become split, torn apart. What in other words would be called an abortion of nature. With a double center of gravity. With a huge disequilibrium. This kind of person is extremely untrustworthy. Is very dangerous. Because they have the solar astral body, which gives them capacities to investigate elements in the superior worlds consciously and at will. To consciously and at will go out of the body and use the astral body to investigate phenomena of nature as a soul. And they have that right. But the ego is still alive in them. Their pride is still alive. Their lust, their envy, their anger, their resentment. So whatever they see, whatever knowledge they gather, whatever visions they have, can easily be corrupted by their own mind. And they can come back physically and begin to criticize other people, to attack them, to act sanctimonious, to act like a saint, and to mislead people. But this is still not the worst type. Within this fourth type of Hanas Musen, there are many kinds, many particulars. Because the more development that the soul has, developing the solar mental body, developing the solar causal body, or even going beyond that and becoming a bodhisattva, they're gaining more mastery in the superior worlds. The spirit is becoming a greater and greater entity with more beauty and wisdom. But if the ego is remaining alive, that split is growing. The center of gravity becomes even more precarious such that there is a certain point at which that whole creature becomes an abortion of nature. And the Master Samael often re- refers to Andromalek. Andromalek is precisely this kind of bizarre formation, bizarre creation, who is both a master of the white and a master of the black at the same time, but is failed. And it's failed because the human soul is fallen. That centaur has descended into the abyss like Chiron. In Dante's Inferno, Chiron, the great centaur, lives in the seventh circle of hell. If you know the Greek mythology, you know that Chiron was the great teacher. He was the exception to all the centaurs. The centaurs were known to be passionate, brutal, violent creatures, addicted to their passions. But Chiron was different. He taught all the great heroes. He taught Theseus, Ajax. He taught them how to conquer and become solar gods, solar heroes. He taught them how to make the soul, to create the solar bodies. He was an initiate, but he was a centaur. He had not dissolved his ego. In Dante's Inferno, Dante places Chiron there in the clipop. Even though Chiron had these capacities and was well respected, he nonetheless belonged to the clipop because he did not dissolve the ego. This is symbolic of teachers, of bodhisattvas, of students who develop some level of the soul but do not eliminate the ego. They remain there with pride alive, with lust alive, envy, fear, self-hate, shame, 
anxiety. All of these elements. We are a centaur of some form. It's urgent that we dissolve the ego. This is why we focus on meditation all the time when we study Gnosis. To analyze our mind. To analyze our heart. To change. To sincerely become a good person. Not just to act like one. To become one. So that right action becomes spontaneous. Not forced. Not assumed. Not sanctimonious. Andra Malek is given as an example because any student, any person who uh, is investigating occult science of some kind, whether it's in Gnosis or another tradition, may try to invoke Andromalek and call Andromalek. But you never know which one will come. The white master or the black master. And believe me, the black one looks white. He's awake. He knows who he is. He knows what he is. But what the Master Samael stated was that Andromalek of course, is fallen. The being is not. The white master, Atman, has all the virtues and gifts and beauties of a genuine and established master, angel. But his human soul is a demon. And until that demon is recycled by nature, that master cannot advance, cannot gain more mastery. That's why that soul is considered an abortion of nature, because that split is there, and until the split is resolved, the master can't walk. How do you walk if you have two centers of gravity? You can't. You need to have a single centered balance to use your feet and walk. This is why sometimes a centaur is, dem- is demonstrated or shown with two faces, one pointing in either direction. That's the nature of a Hannes Musen or Hannes Mus. One face is walking the wrong way, and one face is walking the right way. Neither one can get anywhere because they're stuck together, trapped, until the impure part is cleansed. But in the case of Andromalek or another entity like that who's created the solar bodies it takes millennia because those solar bodies do not belong to Mother Nature. Mother Nature did not create them and so also has a very hard time destroying them. It takes a long time to cleanse that ego. The Sagittarian person can dis- demonstrate some of these contradictions. To be very bright, very sharp, as a, as a mind, as a heart. Have a lot of heart. But at the same time, to be very victimized by their own passions. To be misled misguided by their own passions, like a centaur is. To have a hard time controlling lust in particular. And Samael Anvoyor stated that. That the problem that Sagittarians get hurt by the most is their own lustfulness, their own passionate nature. This becomes very painful for them. The Sagittarian also has a lot of courage and can fight. That influence of Sagittarius as a celestial force is very powerful. It can give us tremendous strength to overcome adversities. You may witness a person who's a Sagittarian who 
is in the worst possible circumstances and everyone's thought it's hopeless for them, but they rise up. They overcome it. This is a unique capacity that the influence of Sagittarius can provide to any soul, but particularly to the Sagittarian, the person born under that influence. In synthesis, it's vital and necessary that we investigate the nature of our own self to question the impulses that arise physically for us to act, emotionally for us to act, and intellectually, mentally. To look into every phenomenon that arises in our mind and remember the centaur. If we're investigating or following some spiritual path, do not rest. Do not assume that you have sanctity, that you've achieved anything. You always have to look for your own animal aspect and remain aware of it. Because otherwise you can fall into mistake. Believing you are a saint and ignoring the truth that is in your own mind. Further, even if you have the, the great blessing to have an experience consciously with your own inner divinity, to have a conscious experience with your own divine mother, with your own spirit, your own divine father, or even with some component of your soul which you can converse with, always remember the centaur. And remember, God has no form. Even if you experience God in an experience of some kind, in the astral plane or the mental plane, the causal plane, don't take that experience as your real self. Because from that you can create an I, a false sense of self. And you can remain as a centaur. The one who becomes free of being a centaur kills the animal inside. Like the ancient warriors kill the dragon. The dragon is inside. Remember Heracles. Heracles encountered the centaurs and dined with them. But they became so enraged and impassioned by the wine, he had to fight them off. And what did he fight them with? His bow and his arrows. But the arrows, he had dipped in the blood of the hydra, which he had conquered previously. The hydra, as you remember, is that many-headed serpent or dragon. Those heads are the egos. Usually there's seven, the seven capital sins. Sometimes there are nine, which relate to the nine spheres of the klipot, which is the same dragon from the book of Revelation who has seven heads and ten horns. When Her Heracles kills the hydra, he dips his arrows in the blood because the blood, the force, the energy, is so potent and powerful. And this is the symbol of comprehension of him taking the forces from the ego, transmuting his sexual energy, and utilizing that force against his own mind, the centaur. So he killed them. And this is what we have to do. We have to conquer our own passion, our own lust, our own pride, our own envy, and take the forces that we extract and continue to fight against the ego. You see there first he dominates a certain part of the ego related to the hydra. Then he has to dominate another part of the ego related to the centaur or that split personality, solar and lunar. A lot of wisdom in those myths. They aren't just fancy stories. They have initiatic wisdom. Any questions? What 
you mean? The rule of Sagittarius, Jupiter. The symbol with the arrow? The planet, Jupiter. Yeah. And what about it specifically pointing at? In relation with Sagittarius, what is uh, related with? Jupiter? Jupiter. Do you have something in mind? Uh-huh. So in this case, uh, it's, uh, uh, how to apply uh, Jupiter? Well, my understanding, of course, Sagittarius is related to the planet Jupiter. And Jupiter, of course, is the king, that one who provides the majesty, the rulership. When we work with the forces of Sagittarius, Really, we're working in the house of Jupiter, so there's an influence there. And the Master Samael taught a practice whereby we can harness those forces. The practice is simple. You squat down on your feet like uh, people in India do or people in South America. And you put your palms, your hands on your knees with the index fingers pointing up. And you meditate and you visualize those forces of Sagittarius flooding you, but particularly to influence the pineal gland. The sign of Sagittarius has a particular influence related to clairvoyance and the capacity to perceive that which is beyond the physical. This is why it's so important for us to develop discrimination when we're observing ourselves, to be able to discriminate between the, all the different qualities that arise in our three brains, the impulses to act, to think, to feel. We have to apply that same discrimination to what we see clairvoyantly in meditation, <clears throat> through visions, Without that discrimination, we can take our visions as concrete facts and we can easily be misled. To see clairvoyantly is natural, but to see objectively without the filter of the ego is something unusual. Normally, we see what the ego is showing, what the ego perceives. In, in any moment, if you're thinking, there are images processing in your mind. That's clairvoyance. But with meditation, with transmutation, and work in this kind of science, that capacity becomes enlivened, inflamed. Your imagination becomes more vibrant, more illuminated. So the capacity to see things is enhanced stage by stage. This is also why the danger grows to be misled and why instructors and teachers can begin to believe they are becoming enlightened because they begin to see more. But that doesn't mean they're seeing the objective truth, the ultimate truth, which is right for you, the view of emptiness, or dependent origination. Most of the time we see through the filter of the eye. Even if it's clairvoyant, it's through the filter of the eye. The levels of clairvoyance are they the levels of Hanasmusin? The question is, are the levels of clairvoyance related with the levels of Hanasmusin? Absolutely. Of course. We know there are five fundamental types of clairvoyance. But in general, we group, we group them as two. Objective, which sees the levels of truth free of ego. And subjective, which sees according to the ego. So the, the first levels of the Hannes Mus are going to predominantly have their imagination caught in the ego's desire. 
So whatever they fantasize or daydream or imagine is going to be related to ego. Whatever they dream will be related to ego. Whatever they visualize, whatever they imagine will be projected desires. Some of them may learn to meditate. Any person can learn to meditate. And in that process of meditation, we're developing a receptive mind in order to perceive. But those perceptions remain subjective until the ego is separated from the consciousness. And this is called samadhi. Just because someone has developed that capacity to see without the filter of the ego does not mean they are enlightened. It only means that they've experienced the separation of the free consciousness from the egoic consciousness. However, samadhi has its aspects too. A black magician is able to see clairvoyantly and to see with great concentration and to see images very clearly but through the filter of the ego. And they call it samadhi. It's a form of samadhi in the sense that they are perceiving phenomena beyond the physical world and they're perceiving it very clearly. But this is subjective clairvoyance or infernal because what they're perceiving belongs to the klipop. It may be razor sharp and perfectly clear with lots of color and long standing, consistent. That doesn't make it objective. Full and real samadhi or objective clairvoyance is the capacity to see in the superior worlds. But to see in that way, we have to free the, the consciousness from the ego. And the forces of Sagittarius can assist with that. When we do that practice and meditate on the influence of Sagittarius, we're meditating to get assistance to learn to see clearly without the interference of our own karma, our own ego, pride, lust, envy. As an example, we may uh, hear somebody say, oh, Tom is a sorcerer. He practices black magic. When we hear that, we form a concept in our mind about Tom. And then that night, we may have a dream about him, and we see him as a black magician. And then we are convinced to, we have to avoid him, or we have to treat him badly. Be mean, be cold. We might even meditate, arrive at the moment of having a very still mind, and perceive clairvoyantly Tom doing some kind of black magic or fornicating or doing something adulterous, something bad. So then we're convinced Tom is a black magician. He's a bad guy. All the while ignoring that we produced that image. We did. Because we listened to gossip. We took someone else's word as truth and we formed an image in the mind, and then when we see that, we believe it's true. And then we make mistakes. We judge people, we treat them badly, and we get karma for that. So to learn how to discriminate visions requires a lot of patience and a lot of meditation and great restraint. You have to be extremely restrained. If you see things, keep your mouth closed and meditate. Jesus said, do not judge. And he also said, whoever is without sin, let him throw the first stone. None of us have the right to judge anyone else or to accuse anyone else. None of us have the right to say so-and-so is a black magician or so-and-so is a Hannes Musen or so-and-so is a witch because all of us are that. All of us have the ego alive and we are equally condemned to suffer the consequences of our actions. Therefore, we have to cultivate compassion. We have to cultivate understanding. 
The Master Samael stated a beautiful thing. He said, Injustice is not corrected with blows, violence, but by teaching the truth. Darkness is not dispelled with violence, but with the light. Another question? A satyr is the similar kind of symbol. It's the bestial nature of a man, but typically it's related to lust. And you have uh, female symbols like that too, um, the servants of Dionysus, who are conscious elements that are trapped in animal elements and so perform according to the animal desires. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. We'll see you next week. Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.